Yes, I believe God gave us memories that we may use to take expense-paid trips back into time and relive some of our younger days. When we had our whole lives ahead of us, there are some things we would do differently, but then there were other times, well, you wouldn't have missed the experience for anything. You can listen to the rumble, the rattle, and the roar as we go freighting northward on the lake and to the shore. Hear the mighty roar of the fourteens, hear the lonely breaky call. Stopping you for coffee on the SNR freight hole. There were many a sleigh load of non perishable food supplies, canoes, tin heaters, and you name it, that were delivered over these winter trails to the trading posts and fish camps. Summer supply depots of gasoline were replenished for airplanes and motorboats, and on the return trip, sleighs were loaded with frozen fish that were destined for the tables of many a Canadian and a USA home. There were several companies in the business, however, the one that I relate to was the SNR Transportation, owned and operated at that time by Swain and Schooley Sigvison and Scafti and Baldy Rigdal. It was in the late 40s and I was around 18 years of age. The war was over. Jobs weren't that plentiful, especially in, this, in the winter. I'd been inquiring everywhere, looking for a job, with little success when someone suggested, why not try this company in Winnipeg that operates a cat train in the north. Well, I had no experience as a cat skinner, especially in that kind of work, and as a brakey, I wouldn't fit the bill as the sleigh poles were heavier than I'd. So there was only one spot left, and that was for a cook. And I can assure you, I was no more qualified to be a cook than for the other two jobs. However, with some persuasion, I hired on, and on December the 26th, after half and Christmas at home, I bravely packed my old army kit bag with all my earthly possessions. Right on top was an old blue ribbon cookbook given to me by my mother, and that became my passport to the north. Well, my destination was Flin Flon, and in those days travel by train was the main mode of transportation, so I departed from Winnipeg, already feeling the qualms of doubt. Well, it was two days later, and I finally arrived, got a room, and went to bed. I'll never forget the following day. It was Sunday. I was all alone in a strange world, sitting on the edge of my bed, when suddenly a knock came on the door. I opened the door, and there stood a man at least six foot tall, broad shoulders, wearing a leather helmet. If you ever seen anyone that looked close to the Red Baron, well, that was him. As I said earlier, I wasn't too big, and being fairly young, he stood there for a moment, then he looked down at me and he said, What did they send you up here for? That was my first introduction to Swain Sigvison. Well, that didn't help my already homesick feeling. However, I let him in. We had a brief conversation, and then he said, Get your gear. Let's get down to the dock, as the cat train is leaving tonight, and I want you on it. Things were a beehive of activity. Sleighs were being loaded and pulled into line. Cats were being serviced for another round trip into the north. I was introduced to the crew, kind of a rough-looking bunch, straggly beards of about two months' growth, and they certainly wouldn't have won the best dressed man of the year award, but under it all I was to find out that they really had big hearts. I suppose before I go any further I need to go back to the statement I made earlier 
When I first hired on, I was no qualified cook, and the time had now come to sink or swim. When I hired, I was assured as long as I could cook bacon and eggs, that would be sufficient. However, I soon learnt bacon and eggs three times a day is not a menu that will keep any hard-working freighter content for too long. In fact, we were not too far out on the trail when I realized deep down inside that I better get out my mother's blue ribbon cookbook and get practicing, or as one kind fellow reminded me, it's a long road back to Flinflon on foot. Well, for the first couple of days out of Flinflon, the road was pretty rough. The caboose reeled to and fro like a ship on the high sea coming to a sudden stop, then lurching ahead with a sudden jerk as cross chains slacked and tightened. When I was a, a boy, I couldn't ride in a streetcar or the back seat of an ordinary car because I got seasick, so you can imagine how my system was reacting to this abuse. My stomach was so upset I had to spend most of my time on the back porch bringing up what I reluctantly had just put down. Well, it didn't take me too long to decide that this was not for me and made up my mind I was going home. I knew we were to meet one of our incoming cat trains, so informed Swain. I was catching it, and that was it. Swain said he understood, and he told me that would be okay. Pack up your gear and be ready when we meet. Well, that night, about nine o'clock, the train came to a halt, and in a few minutes, there were several strange faces in the caboose. Excitedly, they were looking for some mail from home. I didn't spend too much time making conversation, as my mind was made up. I was getting moved out and back to civilization. Well, I quickly got moved, didn't pay much attention to the activity around me, and finally goodbyes were said, and we were off. But as I looked out that window, something didn't seem right to me. We were not heading for Flin Flon at all, but it made a wide half-circle, and we were heading out onto the lakes, where we would spend the next six weeks. To put it plainly, Swain had pulled a fast one on me. I had been tricked, but it was the turn that charted my course for the next four years. Swain Sigvison was a powerful man. In fact, he had represented Canada in sports relating to the throwing of the discus and the javelin. But he had another power I had learned to be aware of, and that was a smile that came over his face whenever you were dealing with him. It had a way of breaking down your resistance. Well, I was now settling into my job somewhat better. Travel on the lakes was smoother, and my stomach was becoming accustomed to the rolls. Cat trains, they traveled 24 hours a day with shifts of six on and six off, six off for the Skinners, but my job began with breakfast from 5.30 a.m. to 6.30 a.m., coffee at 9, dinner 11.30 till 12.30, coffee again at 3 p.m., supper 5.30 till 6.30, coffee again at 9, then the rest of the time was my own. Our bunks were at one end, and the kitchen area was at the opposite end. So quarters were a bit compact, but that was home from December to early April. Using the term loosely, we were a close family. Cooking on a cat train couldn't be compared exactly to the facilities of the Waldorf Astoria. First of all, the Waldorf kitchen was fixed, didn't move, but you had to be an acrobat to cook on the cat train. 
as it dipped and it dived over the long portages like a ship on the high sea. There was many a time while washing the dishes I had to hook my head on a shelf above and my heels on a board that was especially nailed on the floor just for that particular situation to keep you from flying this way or that. I had to always leave a pot in the dishwater to act as a splashboard or I'd get soaked. I usually had to plan my meals according to the terrain over which we would be traveling. If we were going to spend some time on the lake, I could have soup and more of a liquid type of menu. But if it was going to be on the land, it meant strictly solid foods. There was a six inch railing that was put around the top of the stove to keep the kettle and the big coffee pot from landing on the floor and there was many a time I believe the friction on the bottom of the pots from sliding back and forth could have kept the coffee pot hot. I believe one of the most disturbing moments came about at the second year I was on the job and we were moving the God's Lake mining equipment into northern Ontario and we'd been loading machinery from the mine for a distant and we'd been sitting still for near on 24 hours which was kind of nice. Mickey Bergdison was the swing boss and I asked him Mickey when do you plan on pulling out and he figured oh around 2 p.m. by the time we get things loaded and tied down so I thought this would be a good time to make some lemon pies as the stove was sitting level and still. Well, all went well and around 11.30, five steaming lemon pies sat on the shelf by the back of the stove just over top of the wood box. When, without any warning at all, bang, the caboose lifted about a foot off the ground and five lemon pies, one after another, landed in the wood box. Well, my basic job was cooking, however. I did take a turn at cat skinning, especially when the men had been running pretty long hours and they got very tired. One night after a rough day, we approached an area on the lake north of Flin Flon where travel was dangerous. Swain himself was driving the lead cat and when he felt that we were safe he came back to the caboose and asked if I would drive for a while so he could get some rest. It was shortly after midnight and his instructions were there is a fork in the road ahead stay to the left don't go to the right as that would take us to Deep Bay and incidentally that was now out of bounds as two men had recently drowned from another company when the cat went through the ice. Well, I agreed to spell them off, so headed for the lead machine as there were three in the train. I no sooner got rolling when I noticed the trail was turning to the right and it something was wrong. I crawled off and headed back to the caboose to discuss it with Swain, who by now was asleep. He slowly got out of bed, walked to the back door, but on surveying the situation came to life rather abruptly, and what he had to say cannot be put in this tape. I was on the wrong trail and had to be plowed back to the main road. The plow cat was then brought up front did his job which took about half an hour and I was told in rather a firm manner to get with it. Well the whole escapade got my Irish up slightly but I did as I was told. The particular machine that I was on was called the Mermaid as it had gone through the ice recently and this particular machine had a slight crack in the block and this allowed a bit of vapor to, into the combustion chamber which seemed to increase the power and the, the speed of course was increased accordingly and it run about two miles an hour faster than the other machines. 
So, still being a little bit hot under the collar, and the fact this machine had a little more speed, I took advantage of the situation, put the tractor in the big wheel, and never stopped till I got to Rabbit River about 5.30 in the morning, where there was some folk there I knew, and I had a good breakfast. But Swain and the boys got a little hungry before they, they had breakfast, arriving about a half an hour later to catch up with the cook. Travel could be dangerous. When the weather was real cold, chances of ice cracking and a machine dropping through was not uncommon. In the springtime, just before the end of the last trip, there would be water and slush covering quite wide areas on the lake, making travel rather hazardous but these final runs had to be made. The experience that I remember the best was the trip we had to make into Wollaston Lake where the Saskatchewan government had two fishermen test fishing the area. This trip took us all approximately 400 miles north of Flin Flon into unfamiliar territory. During the trip we had problems. To start things off, we lost a cat through the ice, so that left us with two machines. Then soon after, the fuel pump went on another, so now we were down to one machine. But the decision was to go on. We arrived well, that evening about 9 p.m. at the fish camp, but found we had to go to an out camp to pick up part of our load. One of the fishermen was there was to guide us safely to the destination. However, about 11 p.m. I was preparing to go to bed. And there was a sudden stop. I heard a wild scream and we knew we were in trouble. The brakey he came bursting through the door. We had been led into open water. The cat was down and the sleighs were slowly slipping in as the water rose up onto the ice. Well, we knew we had to act pretty quickly. It would only be a short while until the whole train, including our home, the caboose, would uh, submerge and we'd be left then, well, to freeze. So with our parkas half done up and our overshoes flopping, we had to run to an island cut a tree and drag it back to about 50 feet behind the caboose and cut a hole in the ice and uh, with all the strength and breath we could muster we ran round and round winding a cable on our makeshift winch which moved the caboose inch by inch till finally we got it out onto solid ice and far enough from danger of sinking. Well, it was several long days and nights before help came, but finally we were rescued and we began to make the long trek home. Well, life on the cat trains was never dull. There was always something happening every day worth a good laugh. One of the things we didn't have was a, a laundromat where we could slip down and do our weekly wash. So the dirty clothes would usually accumulate in a bag for two to three weeks, which was usually the time it took to make a round trip from Ilford and back. There was a native lady on top of, up on the hill that took in wash, so that's where everybody headed as soon as they hit town. And, and within a couple of days you could pick your washing up and it was amazingly clean and fresh and the cost was minimal. One of the things I couldn't figure out is how did you know how to keep everybody's clothes separate? But I don't remember even losing the socks or any of my underwear. One uh, humorous incident uh, I remember was when a, a young fellow had come up there new and it was his first time to take his wash up to our native lady and he wasn't acquainted with the prices or any of the procedure that went on, but anyway. But when he arrived back from picking up his wash, he was in kind of an irate condition. We, we asked him what was the problem. 
And he said, that has to be the most expensive laundry that I've ever had anything to do with. He said, I asked her for my clothes. She gave them to me, and I gave her a dollar. And she said, Kwani. So I gave her another dollar. And again, she said, Kwani. Well, this happened a couple more times until I didn't have any more dollars left, so I just turned and came back. I don't know how much more she wanted. Well, we informed him that Kwani means enough, so really he had given her a fairly large tip. There was one experience I had that left an impression on me for a few weeks, and I do mean this literally as the impression was black and blue. We'd arrived back in Milford during the day, so the boys had made their way that night to John Hatley's water hole. I'd finished up work in the kitchen and went out for a walk, but on arriving back at the caboose, I found an intruder filling his parka pockets with some of our supplies off the shelf. That's one thing I could say for s &R transportation. We always had lots of good food around, and but unfortunately, sometimes some of the other companies would run low and we'd have to help them out for the time being. Anyway, here was this big fellow, about 225 pounds, loading up his pockets. I knew him. I, we had, he had been freighting for several years, as well as the rest of us, so I told him, well, it's okay, you take what you need, but I have to put it down in this little book so we know just what you have to return. Well, I don't know what happened when I turned to reach up onto the shelf to get my little book to record it in. I never heard him move, but something caught me right behind the ear. And I don't remember too much more till I came back to, but anyway, he commenced to tune me in with his boots when I hit the floor. And when I come to, I was... covered with trademarks of large red and blue blotches from waist up and under my jaw and my face. Uh, in other words, he really put the boots to me. The next day, Swain asked if I wanted to press charges, but I didn't feel that would do any good. He'd been drinking, so really he didn't mean to do it, but I did tell him that I had a piece of cordwood behind the door and I'll return the favor the next time he shows up. Well, basically it turned out much better than that. For In a couple of days, he came and apologized. You say, why did he come to apologize? Well, I had a little swing boss by the name of Mickey, Berg, Mickey Bergson. He was actually a year younger than I was, but he had a six-inch punch like a cannon, and when he found out what this fellow had done, he took him for a fatherly talk in the washroom of the hotel, and I believe that was about the quietest that hotel had ever been in years, as everyone figured this big guy was going to come through the wall. Anyway, it wasn't too long after this that he apologized, and everything was made right. As I said previously, cat train life was exciting. There were so many more experiences that one could relate. But one thing I did learn after the first year was that the, the cook is really the boss. I enjoyed working with SNR Transportation but it was a life for a single man, so 1949, I got married, I decided that was enough, put my cookbook on the shelf, and every time I mentioned to my wife about cooking experience on the northern cat trains, she says I don't believe it. It was a Saturday afternoon in early June in 1981. 
The occasion was the men's fellowship retreat at Ignis, Ontario. It was during our fish derby and my two sons, Daryl and Kevin and I, were anchored near the base of a waterfall. The current was fast, but that was where the big ones usually were caught. And as we sat looking up at the falls with its waters cascading against the boulders below, we didn't need to be told it would be very dangerous to go any closer. When all of a sudden at the top of the falls appeared a torpedo-shaped boat carrying a person, and it was something to behold as he shot over the falls, fighting madly with a two-bladed paddle to stay afloat, when suddenly he struck a rock, flipped over, and he disappeared. It was only a moment till the craft surfaced, but the passenger was gone. And then he appeared, struggling for something to grab hold of, bleeding about the face from the rock lacerations, and there was no doubt he was in trouble. He was hurting, he needed help. And as he neared a huge rock, he reached out and catching hull, pulled himself up on it. He was safe. We could now get to him with our boat and take him to shore. That night as I lay in bed and the picture kept crossing my mind time after time, and then it was just as the, though the Lord spoke and said, Blake, did you not remember that scene today? It was very much like a playback of your own life and the rough waters that brought about your salvation. My childhood memories were of the farm. Times were hard as most folks experienced in the 30s, but I was blessed with a mother and dad who sacrificed personal needs so their family could have the best possible. Sundays, it was a natural thing to go to Sunday school, though it wasn't full gospel, but we did hear about God. And as I neared, neared my early teens, I quit going, and soon Sunday really didn't mean anything special to me at all. And I began to see things in the world that interested me more, and being a determined person soon was doing the things that which I wanted to do. And as I look back over those years, being a parent now myself, I realize my parents must have spent many a sleepless night and had good reason for the hurt that showed in their faces many a time. I was married in 1949, and the following year, Lucille and I were blessed with our first daughter, Candace. The kind of work I was in seemed to keep me busy. In fact, Sundays were really no different than any other. My wife and I found time for the dances and shows and parties, God had no place in our marriage. We were traveling down life's stream, unaware of the falls that lay ahead. It was early in September of 1953 that a very busy time of the year. We had just recently been blessed with our second daughter. She was three weeks old, and suddenly one afternoon she woke up in severe pain. My wife called for me to come, and together we took the baby to the local doctor. Before the day ended, we found ourselves standing in the children's hospital in Winnipeg, our little girl was very sick, and the doctor's uncertain of the cause. The following nine days are ones I will not forget as I walked the hallways of that hospital listening to the babies crying, some from pain, some lonesomeness, and some crippled, possibly never to walk, watching nurses as they moved from one to another, trying to meet the needs of each one individually, and then to look into the little bed where our own little one lies so sickly, but pretty and pink, but gasping for every breath, like would be the last. All of a sudden, my life values were not important anymore. I had hit rough water. I was hurting. I needed help. My wife, as a young girl, had had Christian upbringing. Her mother and dad were saved in Tacoma, Washington, but she never really accepted Christ as her savior. We were now in the waiting room of the hospital. Eight days had passed, and that night a service was being held in Calvary Temple. And as we looked at it, the little book of John we picked up off a stand, we were agreed we would go to church that night. And when the altar call was given, from high in the balcony, two weeping young people made their way down the long stairway to the altar and accepted Christ as their personal Savior. That night the congregation stood with us and prayed for our little daughter. Lord, have your way. Touch her body. Deliver her from pain that just wouldn't let go. When we returned to the hospital, the nurse met us with the news. Your little girl is sleeping so peacefully. Her pain is gone. And as we looked down into that little bed and saw her breathing so normal, her skin so pink and fresh, through tear-dimmed eyes, we could only say, Thank you, Lord.
The following day God took her home to be with him. The following months were not easy, but our lives took on a new meaning and we looked daily to him. God delivered me immediately from drinking and smoking and the language I was in the habit of using had no place in my vocabulary. To me this was a miracle in itself. Shortly after our conversion we decided to move from the town to a farm that we could rent. It had good potential. It was an opportunity I had been looking for to work in with our custom work business. And there was no doubt we could make money. It just meant working a few hours extra each day. However, there was one area I hadn't considered. If the elements aren't right, farming can be a costly experience. The next two years, floodwaters crossed our farm in the early June, taking the crop with it each time. So we decided, decided we'd quit the farming and custom work and look for a job. We had lost in two years financially what we had made in seven, but our spiritual gain more than that made up for it. Hebrews, the 13th chapter, the fifth verse, reminds us, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And some might say, how could you say that when you lost your crops? Yes, we lost our crops, but it was a time we drew closer to God asking his help, and he did just that. It was too late to plant any grain, but in late June I was able to get back on a high piece of ground and sowed it to a millet hay, which usually grew 30 inches high. But when cutting time came and I sat on the row crop tractor with wheels five foot high and the millet double its natural height, I could only say, praise the Lord, as dairymen picked up the entire crop and the money covered the cash rent that we owed. We could look back to that time on the farm when God blessed our home with a very special event, a sister for candy, and we named her Sharon. That fall, I began a new job that has been our means of livelihood ever since, working for a grain company. Our new home was 200 miles away from old friends and family, and there was no full gospel church within 40 miles. There were times of loneliness and with a new job frustration, it was our wilderness journey, but we had God's word. I remember on one occasion, we were down and discouraged. I had closed the elevator early and gone home when a knock came to the door and there stood a young man with a guitar in his hand. His name was Ernest Shelbury. God had told him of our needs, even told him the house we lived in. And before he left that evening, our spirits had been rearranged into proper perspective and we shared God's word from the Bible and listened to his message in song. We lived in this area for three and a half years. Every day seemed to be a growing experience with the Lord and soon we were given opportunity to share our faith with different folks of the community. The time came the time came we were to be transferred. And the one place I really didn't care to move to was our own hometown as I thought of my life before, I was saved and really wouldn't contribute to my acceptance as a businessman there. However, that's exactly where we were sent, and once again, as I looked to the Lord, he never ceased to amaze me how he answered prayer and lay new challenges daily. This testimony could never allow room to tell them all. One good part of the move, we were close to the Pentecostal Church in Carmen now and could attend a regular worship program. On taking over as manager of the grain elevator, I found we were doing a very low percentage of the business. There was one other company in town and the farmers were satisfied with their returns there, so why should they change? The first year was a bit rough as I watched large lineups past my plant going in and out of the opposition. Farmers were really friendly, but that didn't put any grain in our bins. There was one practice I started right from the beginning. God's word was to be kept on top of my desk, not in the drawer. In the lineup that would pass my door was a goodly number of Christians from a Mennonite Brethren Church in the country just east of our town six miles. Time to time, the odd one would drop in, and our conversation would soon turn to God's word. And, and though I didn't receive any business that day, the next eight years saw business grow beyond my comprehension, and I thank God for it. 
time nor space, it does not allow me to relate the many testimonies and sharing times I was privileged to enjoy along with the day's business. I remember the day four of us shut ourselves away in a fertilizer shed away from the hubbub of business and the foundation for the first crusade of the area was laid. I remember the morning the son of a local businessman was to have a serious brain operation. The doctor's diagnosis gave little encouragement. But that morning at 7.30 a.m. as we drove slowly along the street, picking up anyone who wanted to come, we proceeded out to the little church in the country where farmers had shut down their tractors or left their chores and came in their overalls. And at 8 a.m. when the surgery's knife passed through that line of life and death, God answered the prayers of each one there. The operation was a success. One of the most exciting experiences was the year the spring rains had continued on so long that seeding of a regular crop had got too late in the heavy soil part of the country, which made up 65% of our farm area. The local ag rep advised the farmers to sow buckwheat even at this late date, but there was little or no seed available at the seed houses, and a very limited market for sale was available at that time. It seemed hopeless. My supervisor was passing through, and as we discussed the serious plight of the farmers, I related if we only could find a bin of buckwheat seed, it would be the answer. It was like an electric current hit him as he jumped up and told me he had coffee two days before with a young man in Winnipeg who two years ago had thrashed a bin full and hadn't been able to get rid of it. Well, I don't need to tell you how long it took for me to find him the buckwheat, the trucks to haul it, and the cleaning and distribution. And within the week, it was all in the ground. Growing. Growing conditions were good. The crop came so thick that a representative from a seed company in Winnipeg said, I wouldn't advance one plug nickel on that crop as it stands too rank to set. But the faith of those farmers was greater than than his, and as I visited the Thanksgiving service at that little church in the country, ten days before the actual harvest began, and saw the offering plates overflowed with money that I really didn't think they humanly could afford at that time. And God made good his promise, the buckwheat crop, which usually leads 20 bushel an acre, rent from 25 to 40. Not only that, but a new market hit Manitoba for buckwheat at a cash price of two dollars per bushel. It was an answer to many a prayer. Well, eight years had passed. One day the manager of the country operation dropped in and asked me if I would take the position as a district manager and gave me three hours to decide and he left. This was a very difficult decision. I didn't feel qualified to handle a job and it meant taking our children out of school the end of December well, it just meant a lot of changes would be experienced. Well, I went home and we prayed about it, and on the 2nd of January, 1968, our new residence was in Verdon, Manitoba. One thing that was important before we made the decision to move was there had to be a full gospel church in the town, preferable our PAOC, and there was. It was a small assembly. The little old church didn't boast any frills, but from the moment we arrived, the love and the friendshipness of the congregation, pastor and wife, made us feel so welcome. During the years spent in Verdon, I was privileged to serve on the local church board and witness God's work in so many wonderful ways, which included, included one day leaving the little old church and moving into a beautiful new one. I was happy to work on crusade committees that saw denominational barriers broken down and many souls won for Christ was able to help with distribution of God's work through the Gideons International. Sometimes a person seems to get a, a bit weary, but when one saw God honoring his word, it was worth it all. My job involved a lot of traveling, and I wouldn't dare leave home out of my driveway without asking God to supply guidance and protection for the day. I could testify to God's protection so often, at the time I glanced down for a moment to the car seat beside me, and on looking up I saw a huge semi-trailer bearing down on me on my side of the road. The driver, driver appeared asleep, but awoke in time to swerve back and around me by inches. 
And again, when a trailer in tow behind a car meeting me became unhitched, pulled over on my lane, and just feet in front of me, headed for the ditch and exploded in a hundred pieces. My work involved climbing around in the high grain elevators, and one day in one of our highest plants, the man lift brake didn't hold, and I was deposited in the empty shaft 70 feet above ground, hanging by my chin and clawing with my hands to hang on till the slivers in them looked like a mass of porcupine quills. And as I hung there, it seemed like someone lifted me by the seat of the pants and put me safely on the bin top floor. Sometimes we are faced with circumstances we don't understand, but I'm glad I have learned to put my trust in him. Five years ago, I contacted a disease that involved paralyzation of the muscles in the eyelids, mouth, and worst of all, the throat. This past summer, it reoccurred. It was necessary I spent a month in the Brandon Hospital, and on July the 1st, my condition was such I couldn't barely swallow, chew, or see, and I felt I could choke to death at any time, and yet all human possibly was being done. It was a Saturday night. I felt so discouraged, but as I looked to the stand beside me, with a little picture I just received from our little, little granddaughter, she seemed to say to me, Grandpa, don't give up. And tears came into my eyes, and I prayed, Lord, please help me. Make my throat muscles come alive. And little did I know that night that down at Manhattan Beach Camp special prayer was being held and back home in Verdon the Christians also were praying. And 10 o'clock that night my throat began to have feeling and praise God I was in, on the road to recovery. My doctor came in later and told me that he had given me only two more hours and then he would have moved me into intensive care where my throat would have been opened in a series of tubes inserted to keep me alive. As I look back over the years to the time when I reached out in those turbulent waters and caught hold of the rock Jesus Christ, I have so much to be thankful for and to praise him for. I'm glad the message of salvation is given for all people regardless of color, creed, social standing or whatever. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whomsoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I am glad I believed and accepted and experienced Romans 3.20, where it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will sup with him and he with me. He was my life. I see the broken heart I had was good for me. He tore it all.
my eyes with tears that I might see the glory of himself revealed to me I I could not know that he had wounded hands until I saw the blood that day upon the sands I saw the marks of sheep Hi, Shalian and Tyler. I'm down here at the train station, just waiting for Carly Dawn to come in on the train. Do you hear the train coming down the track? Here she comes. I can see her looking out the window. Oh, and who you got with you, Carly Dawn? Hi, Carly Dawn. Hi. Glad to see you. Who you got with you? My bunny rabbit. Oh. Where have you... Oh, the train's just stopping now. Oh, there, I'm waving to her out the window. I'm going to run down the platform now here and just say hi to her. Okay, the train is coming to stop. Carly Dawn has just come back from a pretend trip down in Disneyland. <laughs> what did you see down there, Carly Dawn? Can you think of some of the things you saw? Did you see the bears in Bearland? Yeah. And what, what's the name of that elephant that you saw down there flying? Uh, I think it's, when I see an elephant fly, it's Dumbo. Dumbo? Oh. Don't forget about the crows. And what about Mickey Mouse? Does he have lots of friends down there? Yes, he has Doll Duck, Goofy, yeah. um, Minnie. Yeah. That's Mi a girlfriend. Who's Mickey Mouse's girlfriend? Minnie! Oh, and then there's Donald Duck, and he got a girlfriend too? Yes, Daffy. What? Daffy? Some kind of a name for a girlfriend. And then what about, was there Peter Pan? Yes, there was Peter Pan. Does Peter Pan have friends too? No, he, well, he just has friends. And what about the three little pigs? Did you see them dancing and playing? Yes, and a wolf too. Oh, a wolf? The fox. Weren't they scared of the wolf? Mm -hmm. Not really, eh? No, what about the, well, you said something about the wizard. Is yeah. there a wizard? Yes, there's a wizard. And what did the wizard do? I don't know, but he, um... Did you go uh, for any rides on the cars down there? Train. A train? Was it the train that went up overhead on a track? No, what's that? That what? was Toodles. Whose? Toodles! Who's Toodles? He's a train, but he doesn't go on Walt Disney. Well, you're all mixed up now. I was talking about the one in Walt Disney. Doodles, did you say? Toodles! Toodles. What is he? He's a train. He's in a storybook. He's not really real. Oh, I see. He's a pretend train. Oh, did you see any giraffes? There was giraffes in Disneyland? No. Well, 
Well, they're there somewhere. No. And a hippopotamus? No. And, well, don't you remember in the picture that hippopotamus in the water? And the gorilla? No, that's all in the zoo. Where? Oh, now, when you were traveling on the train, Carly Dawn, with your friends, did you sing songs? Yes. Could you sing one of the songs for me now? Okay. okay. Do you have another song that you sing? Yes. Okay, let's hear it. My song, it's a person celebration. My song, it's one happy song. My song, it's quite happy song. Carly, when when you were down there, did you see Snow White? Yes. Did she have some friends? Yes, she had some dwarfs. Do you know their name? Well, I only know Grumpy and stuff like that. It's just, that's all you know. And you said you saw some chipmunks. Was yeah. there two chipmunks? Yes. What was their name? Chip and Dale. I thought there was three chipmunks. You're thinking of Alvin Simon Theodore. Oh, I'm mixed up a little bit. Yeah. And there's Mickey Mouse's friend Pluto. Was he there? No. That's not the friend. That's Goofy's friend Pluto. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. And then there was Cinderella. Does Cinderella have friends? Yes. Did she have on a beautiful dress? Yes. What happened to Cinderella at midnight? Well, she lost my golden slippers. And then what? I don't like it changed what it was before. She changed to what she was before? Yes, it was before. And what was she before? Well, she, she had her dirty old rags on. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. And then there's Winnie the Pooh? Yes. Has he got friends too? Yes. Who's his friends? There's Eeyore, Owl, and um, Peter uh, the Rabbit, and um, <sighs> Kangaroo, and um, Pig, Piglet, and um, Christopher Robin. All those are his friends. Mm -hmm. Is that right? You're talking, you said something about a Goombie Bear. What's a Goombie Bear? A Goombie Bear is what we saw in the store. Well, what does it look like? Does Papa, it... you remember at the store we were going to buy the new book. Oh, well, d is it made of fur? Does it have fur on? Or does it... Yes. He's got fur on? Yes. Oh. Well, it's just about time for Carly Dawn to get back on the train. I can hear it. It's coming again. She's the, yeah, she's, the train's coming. Are you just about ready to go home now, Carly Dawn? Yes. You got your bunny rabbit with you? Yeah. Oh, it was sure nice that you and Bunny could drop in and see Grandpa and Grandma for a while. Goodbye. Bye, Bye Grandpa. Well, Shalan and Tyler, Carly Dawn's gone. Gone home on the train. Maybe someday you could get on that B-10 train and you could come down and see Grandpa and Grandma too. That'd be fun, eh? Dad! Shh. Oh. Sh Sh Shalan and Tyler, I got Shane here sitting on my knee. And he's playing with little soldiers on the floor. He go, shh. Can you go, shh? What's the soldier do? Hmm? Can you count the soldiers? Huh? Count the soldiers. One. One, two, three, four. Five. Seven, Six. Eight. One, two. That's right, a whole bunch, <coughs> isn't it? Have, have you got a nice sweater on? Yeah. Nice sweater? Who's on your sweater? Was that? Is that a little boy? Is that 99? Can you say 99? Oh, oh, he just shot me with a gun. Oh, gracious me. Oh, 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 oh. Shane just shooted me with a gun. Oh, oh. Is this a, what's this? Is this a truck? Yeah, it's a truck. It's a truck. Yeah, it's in a nice truck. Oh, oh, Shane just shot the truck. Oh, goodness me.
<coughs> Shoot at the truck. Oh, oh. Yeah. And here's a car. Hey. Eh? Oh, oh, he just <coughs> shot the car. Oh, oh, oh. Did Shane go skating? Can you say skating? Were you skating? Yeah. What were you doing? Where were you skating? On the ice? Were you skating on the ice? Oh, Shane, he can't do nothing but shoot, <laughs> shoot Grandpa here. Did you, did you sit on the bench? Yeah. How come you're sitting on the bench? Were you tired? I oh, yeah, I was on the bench. Oh, he says he was sitting on the bench. Shane was skating, and, and he got tired, and so he just went and sat on the side of the ice on the bench and crossed his knees and said, I sat on the bench. Shane's going to sing happy birthday. Sing happy birthday. Happy birthday. Can you sing? Can't you sing? Uh, oh, yeah. uh, uh.